my name is Elsie Wandera and uh, I am the founder of the Endometriosis Foundation of Kenya. I'm 43 years old. I am in operations at the moment um, and I work for um, a consulting firm called Brands on a Mission. So in addition to that, so I wear many hats. But I'm more passionate about just advocating for the health of um, women, specifically in the space of endometriosis. I really wanted to be a mother. I think I had many dolls. I loved, you know, having dolls. So, you know, just um, even the fact that, um, like my brother, my youngest brother was born, like, uh, you know, a few years after I was born. So it was beautiful. It, you know, that nurturing, um, just the ability to nurture, to take care of someone, I think, um, has always been a part of me. And I've always felt like, yes, I want to be a mother. Um, I didn't know exactly when I wanted to be a mom. Like, I I knew, like, I wanted to, like, just, you know, live a little. Um, hopefully just, you know, do, like, the standard uh, leave the standard script that life has just, you know, society has decided for us. Um, you know, get married, you know, f- finish school, get married, you know, get a job, you know, be successful and then enjoy my time with my, like my husband and then get children later on. Um, but um, interestingly, I, I I got pregnant when I was 16. And so that was like a... Uh, a pause, you know, moment. I was like, okay, this was not the plan. And, um, you know, and unfortunately, um, you know, collectively with my parents, we made a very difficult decision to, um, you know, I, I hate using this word, like terminating the pregnancy, but I feel like that's what it was. Like it was just ending it. Um, but for me, it was, um, and in, they induced the delivery. And so I gave birth. So I experienced that and I was 16, you know, so I think whenever I think about it now, I'm just like, wow, I went through that. Um, (laughs) first, I think just my cervix was not even ready. (laughs) I remember, like, the doctors and nurses just, they were just running around, like, they were looking like they were just panicking because, you know, for three days, like, experiencing just the contractions and everything. And, you know, the child was moving, yes, but it was not coming soon enough. So um, it, after three days, it, it happened. I think I packed there for a long time. I really, I, you know, I really was living in a bowl of shame and guilt. Like just imagining that I had made the worst decision. I kept thinking, you know, this child is probably somewhere out there because, you know, like I I think I carried the pregnancy up to about like eight months. Um, And I knew, like in my mind, I, I kept telling myself this story that, you know, they probably gave away the child for adoption or, you know, they took it to a children's home or something. I just told myself a story. So in my mind, so I kept telling myself, like, my son is out there. And I was so rebellious. I was so angry with my mom, you know, like I was just, you know, just again, projecting that shame and that, you know, that fear of feeling unloved and like a disappointment to my mother and father at such a young age, I'm supposed to be doing other things, but here I was. But, um, I think I had to, I had to deal and work on that, um, but I guess, you know, I guess we can talk about that later. But it it was it was difficult. It was it was so 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 tough because I kept imagining there's like probably like a fifteen year old out there who's imagining where his mother is. So I kept judging myself. You know, I, I kept thinking like I'm the worst person on this planet, and I never extended myself grace. You know, just thinking that I was young, I was in no place or position to be a mother at 16 like I don't I mean we can't even finish that sentence like this is you know so I've I've learned to 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 forgive myself but um 
I guess th- that's how I grew up, you know, just imagining, you know, that there is that person out there. And then the other thing was also, you know, of course, I, I loved seeing my friends, you know, get married and then get pregnant and then have babies. But it was just, I used to be the one crying. Like you would think like, I don't know, it's, it's like my child. And I would always hold those children and live almost vicariously through them. Like, you know, just always desiring that, you know, that motherhood. And um, so I got married. So I got married quite later on in my life. Like I got married when I was 38. So I think I just, I think the thing that I did was just focus now on, on building my career, right? Um, I tried to go to, you know, I went to uni, um, you know, I, I, I thought, you know, I, I thought I was going to find like my Prince Charming and, you know, my husband there. Cause I mean, don't we all like, we find like, we marry like our, either like our college sweethearts or, or something like that. So I think that's the dream that I was trying to live out. Um, but, um, again, it, it never happened. And, and, I, I just, I think I need to explain something, right? So in terms of why it didn't happen. So imagine this, this, this 16 year old me, um, cause I was still, I mean, I'm a 23 year old, you know, in, in campus or, or living life and trying to progress as it were, but I'm still packed at 16. So I'm a 23 year old on the outside and on paper, but on the inside, I am a 16-year-old just trying to defend my turf. So I was trying very hard to achieve that dream, right? To get married, to, to get a boyfriend. I, I really, I, I loved this dude that I, I ended up dating. You know, I really did. And I wanted to get pregnant. But unfortunately, I was having now complications. Mm. And now the complications were, I was having, v- I was experiencing very painful period very like debilitating and just like that pain that you feel like you're being crucified you know um and for me because like you know I think while I was growing up or even when I started my periods when I was like about 15 around there you know my mama told me like you know it's normal you know girls in our family have gone through this so it's okay you know you'll be fine when you get pregnant so again, the goal is let's get pregnant so that we solve this issue. Yeah. But, um, you know, again, it wasn't happening. And then also just, you know, again, because I'm also young, like in my career, I'm still not, you know, I'm not financially secure. Um, neither is my boyfriend. And here I am, I'm, you know, we're, we're trying to have this conversation of, you know, we need to have family and stuff like that. So, one time I was just like, I was so exhausted. I was tired of my painful periods. I was like, you know, I must get to the bottom of this. So that's when I went and saw a gynecologist and I was like, you know, in fact, I remember, I think that was like my first visit ever to a gynecologist. I'd never been to a gynecologist for my 26 years um, in life. And I went to see him and, you know, he just, you know, he listened to me, described my symptoms, etc. I was there with my boyfriend. And then that's when he told me, he's like, he's like you have endometriosis. I was like, what? He's like, yeah. And he's like, the easiest way he could describe it to me is that my uterus was growing inside out. Mm-hmm. And immediately, I remember just like, pa, pa, pa. He landed like some, you know, messages like, you know, just one after the other. You know, you need to get pregnant now or you'll never be able to have children later on in life. And so I'm like, I'm under pressure now. I'm like thinking, hey, this big goal of mine <laughs> of having a child of yeah. being a mother is now being accelerated because of this other issue. So now I was in a quagmire. Mm-hmm. The dude doesn't want that story. Mm-hmm. He's not ready. Me, I'm ready. He is not ready. I'm like, we must do this now. Yeah. So I am putting someone else under and due pressure because they've not realized also like or this this is not a priority for them 
yeah but i blamed him i was like and i attached it to now his love for me i used it to define whether he loves me or not yeah. you know because you don't want to you know you don't want me to be a mother it's like, so you don't love me yeah. i was like you know what is at stake you know i can't give birth because of this disease it seems like it's and you know i did not understand endometriosis then the way i do now and I understand now where the doctor was coming from. But then I didn't understand. So I was like, hey, we're under pressure. We must do this now. So anyway, um, that relationship ended. Yeah. So then again, I just focused on, on my career. I just focused on just trying to, to do the one thing that I could that was within my control. Mm-hmm. And then just grow. And... So at I had my first surgery now for to to deal with endometriosis now when I was 26 after the doctor gave me the diagnosis. And you know I thought I was going to solve the issue then you know after that oh my god it would be a smooth sail no more painful periods. Ah. We went back to one. Um because I was put on um it's almost like a birth control mechanism, but mm-hmm. it's like a hormone suppressant, mm-hmm. if you may. So, you know, just silencing the ovaries for a few months so that they stop producing the estrogen, so that they stop, so that the endometriosis stops growing. Um, I think, let me just land a fact, you know, endometriosis has no known cause, no known cure. So it's like the doctor's, then the doctor then the gynecologist then i think was just trying so it's a hit on me it's like you know like let's just yeah let's just try and manage what you know and and that's the word it's it's managing endometriosis but so that didn't happen so i was like okay so we're back to period so i just i carried the pain again yeah. that was part of my identity yeah. i knew pain was going to be a part of my life and again, looking back, you know, 16, going through that trauma, that amount of pain, you know, I'm not dealing with it. I'm not processing it. So I'm just carrying it nicely too. But then inside, I have such a deep, strong desire to be a mom, but it's not happening. It's not materializing. So I'm getting more frustrated, resenting myself, unforgiving, you know, so... Um, so I didn't, I, 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 I didn't date for a while. I didn't, I was just like, maybe I'm, again, I kept judging myself. I'm like, yeah, I'm not wanted. You know, maybe people can see what I did. There, there's no way, like, there's no label on my face about like the things that I have done, no. the mistakes that I have made in life or, you know, the misdirections and the missteps that I have made in life. No one, no one can see that, but I really Hey, I carried it like a, I wore it like a crown so proudly. And I was like, you know, I'm this girl who's this and that and the other. And so I really believe like it slowed down even my desire for getting into a relationship. I wanted kids. I did. But I'm like, but no, if I can't be with someone, then, you know, I don't, I don't want to do it alone. But then the older I was getting, I was like an understanding, you know, endometriosis and the disease and what it was doing to me, I was like, their chances were just getting slimmer, you know, by the day. And of course, the older we get, you know, as as women, our over our ovarian count is just dropping. You know, I really love. I, I wish I was a dude. Sometimes I think I wish I was a dude. You know, these guys have sperm until the day they die. <laughs> they don't have pressure. They don't have they pressure. Have sperm until the day they die, right? Cool. Like the until even they're ninety, yes. they still have sperm viable concert mm-hmm. but chicks it starts diminishing i think when we are about 28 from from that level upwards yeah. it starts diminishing and for me the more surgeries i was going in for because um all the surgeries that i went in for were treating or removing ovarian cysts that were growing around the ovaries and so what that would mean is that when they would go in they would harvest a part of like my my eggs, my ovarian reserve, and and now I understand where that doctor was coming from. Remember when you were telling me like, yeah, you need to get pregnant today, 
that was where he was coming from because he knew that there is no procedure that is safe to preserve the ovaries. So therefore, any woman who is suffering with endometriosis, the first conversation you should have and your priority should be around your fertility, preserving your fertility. So it's, it's asking yourself, if I'm 28, do I want to have children in the future? Do I understand the impact of the surgery? Like, what's that going to do to me, to my body, to my ovarian um, reserve? And therefore, it means considering things like harvesting your eggs for use later for if you want, like, assisted pregnancies, which which are there, and, and those are options for everyone. So, so that's where I was. Imagine, I'm getting to, like, 35. I'm already thinking about all these options. I'm thinking about, okay, I'll adopt, you know, it's fine. Um, I was aware, like, I was aware of what my body was going through. Um, and so I think by the time I was getting to then, yeah, 37, this dude comes into my life, uh, you know, I was like, ah you know, let's just date. And, you know, we dated for a very brief period and we got married and, um, and you know, again, the marriage didn't last as long. Um, and we weren't able to have any children because even before we got married, I got a definitive diagnosis that I had a very, very, um, small chance of conceiving naturally because like my AMH levels were low and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, he did. We went for the test together. He also went for his test to, to check his, his viability. And, and he was good. He was pretty good. So I think we we were optimistic, but cautiously optimistic. You know, like, you know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, hey, yeah. that's good. So we had conversation around, okay, what happens to us? You know, are we going to be that couple that doesn't have kids? And yeah. if, if we don't, is that okay? It's okay. Um, but later on, I think, you know, in marriage, again, you know, looking at my, my, my friends, again, who are getting married at the same time, you know, they were getting married, getting pregnant. Now that started doing a number on me. Yeah, oh, my God. Hey. <sighs> You think, at you know, at you, oh, you've dealt, oh, you know, you're aware. It's one thing to be aware, mm. but there's another thing. It's another thing to have addressed it or even acknowledged it and then addressed it. Yeah. And that's where now therapy comes in. I hadn't done that. Like, I hadn't processed now everything came tumbling down. Marriage for me was the worst place to be reminded of my, I'm feeling my eyes are hot. It's okay. <laughs> I felt like, like that was the worst time to ever be reminded of my like the cap on my motherhood journey. Like I was like the end. Like it will not happen. It was just all just myself. It was me. There's nothing he ever verbalized to me to say. Like I want children. And if, if you can't have children, I'm not going to be with you for that. You know, blah, blah, blah. Nothing. There was nothing. Or he's like, he's not pleased. Nothing. There was nothing. Whether he felt... It and never communicated, I never got to know, mm. right? And I will never know. But it was a very, it was an internal conversation. Yeah. Oh my God, I tore myself to pieces. I started linking. And of course, because like, again, I, I, I've been talking about my journey with endometriosis. You know, I've been on, on public platforms shared and stuff like that. So my content is out there. So this one day, I think I went um, to like see another recording, I think on YouTube. I think I can't remember which, which media house it was. And there was a dude who was just there and he was like, you know, 
um, this woman is suffering because she had an abortion. Is it talking about you or somebody else? It's talking about me. Wow. And I was like, the misinformation out there about endometriosis, the myths and misinformation that is out there. So we are judging as a society women who are struggling with their fertility and and already deciding that they actually had abortions. We don't have proof. But yet that was the truth for me because I terminated a pregnancy. And I'm like, but how did you see me? Like, how did you know? Yeah. This is a complete stranger. It's a troll, of course. Yeah. But can you imagine what now that did to me? Oh my God. I went into the pits of hell and I just said, I God, you're punishing me. And the endometriosis is punishment. Unfortunately, the fact is that endometriosis, um, the women who suffer with endometriosis fast are one in 10. So one in 10 women around the world. So in to a total of like we're looking at about 200 million women around the world who suffer with this condition. Or, and 30% of the 200 million, actually their fertility is affected. So 30%, it's a very small population, but it's a, it's a significant number. Yeah. One woman who can conceive surely is enough. Like we should be able to find a solution, yeah. right? Yeah. We don't have that information. There is a lot of misinformation. We don't understand that endometriosis is what is contributing to women's, some women's, not all women with endometriosis, but their fertility. Um, and yeah, their infertility. So, you know, I'm like... But someone is out there just making that careless statement, you know, without thinking or even just bothering to read and understand this disease. And so I just buried myself in judgment and I, of course, now my marriage ended and not because of this, but that's when now I decided I was like, okay. I think I have to, let's, let's face the beast. Mm -hmm. um, there's an elephant in the room. And at the time, I thought it was just, you know, just going for therapy just to handle the divorce story. Mm. Then I entered, then of course, you know, the, the therapist always tells you, spill, like, yes, give, me, give me everything. Yes. Just lay it on the table for me. And so I talk and I share and I, and I, and the first day, she is like, Elsie, do you know you are grieving? Mm -hmm. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, yeah, I was, I'm grieving the loss of my, my marriage. She's like, no, you've suffered so much loss. The loss of your child. And then the fourth and final surgery for endometriosis I lost my ovaries mm. 